The Union flag still flies over Scotland, but for how much longer? Struggling with the economic impact of Brexit compounded by the energy crisis, more and more Scots are going through a difficult time. For many, there is only one way out. We very much hope we gain our independence because we deserve it and we're being mistreated by the Westminster government for the last 300 years. Many Scots hope for a second referendum on Scottish independence in October 2023. The first referendum was held in 2014 and 55% of Scots voted to stay in the UK. Heartbroken. I, it felt like somebody had died. Sorry, I can't even thinking about it now. It gets me upset. Another chance. No. The national situation is coming to a head. In the background, opposition to independence is also quietly gathering support. The population, the population in, Scotland in Scotland would not be willing to undergo a period of austerity in order to gain independence. We're in Forfa, a small town about 100 kilometers north of Edinburgh. It's far removed from the politics of Westminster. Sandra McPherson is out shopping. She's heading for a social supermarket set up three years ago. The concept is to sell expired or rejected goods to the socially disadvantaged at lower prices. Sandra's marriage collapsed during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now she's a single parent and retraining as a beautician. She needs to save money wherever she can. Yeah. Just because everything else is going up, all the bills, the petrol, the, the, even in the, your normal supermarkets, there's a big um, price increase in the produce. So this place is definitely um, it's ideal for pe people like me just now. As the months have gone on, I've been using it more regularly now, and I've definitely noticed a big savings in my shopping bills. All right, do you have your card number? I have my card. People in need are eligible for a membership card and can do their shopping here. We've seen an increase, quite a considerable increase, um, in the amount of people signing up and becoming a member. We've got a lot of in-work poverty um, now, which is a situation that you would never have thought uh, you, would, you would even have a terminology called in-work poverty. You know, it shouldn't be such a thing. The last ages. Thank you. Was it cash or card? I've got cash. Perfect. Today. So 290, please. The first crisis was Brexit, which 62% of voters in Scotland opposed. Then came the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. The resulting rise in energy prices has hit Scots harder than other Western Europeans. Costs here are twice as high as in the Eurozone. Shops in Forfa are closing down one by one. With the National Health Service also in crisis, winter threatens to be precarious for many people. Pretty scary. So yeah, I, I like every time I boil the kettle, I, I'm just thinking, how much, how much, how many pennies is that going to be? Ah, no, my God. I did nothing. Joseph and Noah, Sandra's two sons, have to make sacrifices too. Their games console eats up electricity, but Sandra doesn't want to economize on that just yet. For now, the electric light in the room stays off. They can manage with daylight. The same with the shower. The shower is actually more scary. So I find myself now saying, you know, that's it. You've had five minutes, you're clean. You can get out of the shower now. We can't afford for the hot water just running. Whether in rural Forfa or big cities like Glasgow, Many Scots are going through tough times. The gap between rich and poor is widening in the crisis, as can be seen all over the inner city.
Neil Mackay is also feeling the crunch and blames politicians in Westminster. In his opinion, the devolved Scottish government is not completely sovereign and is kept dependent on the UK government in many financial matters. Neil is rehearsing some songs with his friend, Henry Riley. Westminster system is, it, is unreformable. It, it can't be changed from within, so it needs to be smashed up. Scotland's a great country, it's a great society, but people need to be empowered. So that basically what we've done is um, set ourselves the, the submission statement of hosting regular marches, mass mobilisations for independence every year uh, until independence is won. So that's the, that's the task. <laughs> They're about to perform in Glasgow city centre. They're scraping a living as buskers. The weather looks all right as well. Hopefully it stays kind of dry anyway. Well, that's perfect. Neil Mackay is divorced with two children and has to pay maintenance. He's looking for a job, any kind of job. Until he finds one, he hopes to make ends meet singing traditional folk songs about Scottish heroes. He also runs a pro-independence organization all under one banner. The next big demonstration he has organized is the day after tomorrow. He checks the news online and sees one conservative newspaper headline, Edinburgh to be plagued by extreme nationalist march demanding an end to London rule. There is pressure. I mean, I'm the founder of the organization. I do have my name to this procession, so it's my name on the paperwork. Uh, and the authorities always try and you know, if you're inexperienced, they try and um, put pressure on you, so it's all on you. Like, everything goes wrong, anything is your fault. Scottish First Minister Nicola Sturgeon and her Scottish National Party, the SNP, have announced a second referendum on Scottish independence on October 19, 2023. At the time of filming, a judgment from the UK Supreme Court was pending on whether a second referendum could be held without the British government's consent. Why should we ask the English Supreme Court? basically, or the, the court of the British state, which is not going to come down in our favour. Why are we asking them and giving them that power? Why are we giving them the power? It makes no sense. We have given a number of democratic mandates to the SNP government. Uh, and in Scotland, the people are sovereign. We have already said we want a referendum. We've given the legal mandate for that. So nobody should stand in the way of that. Not Westminster should they uh, block it as such, but neither should the Scottish government allow them to block it. It's just ridiculous. You can do it by tomorrow if you dare. You can do it by tomorrow if you dare. What has caused the crisis? Is it the ongoing financial dependence on Westminster in so many matters? Or has the Scottish government been misspending funds? We travel to Stonehaven, a little farther north up Scotland's east coast. Alan Sutherland, who retired over a year ago, is opposed to the Scottish government's plans for a new referendum. As a former IT manager, he advised companies and sold software worldwide. He's earned himself a comfortable nest egg for his retirement, which he can now enjoy with his German wife, Regina Erich. They don't have to worry much about the cost of living. My main argument against independence is that the independence that is being proposed and the build-up to it and the activities of the SNP to get here are not what Scotland needs. Independence has, has got to work. We've got to be successful getting it, and they haven't proved they can do that. Besides gardening, Alan has taken up a new hobby. Describing himself as a Scot and a Brit, he's actively organizing protests against plans for Scottish independence. There's time for a quick coffee before he returns to his computer. 
His wife supports him in his activities. My job doesn't depend on me keeping my mouth shut. I've got a voice. I was a salesman for a long number of years. I know how to get to in front of people and per to persuade people. Now a pensioner, Allen has considerable influence on current debate from his desk. He may be under the radar, but he is very effective. We head back to Forfa, home of many supporters of Scottish independence. Sandra is one of them. They feel they've been hung out to dry by the government in Westminster, an impression exacerbated by the current crisis. You like a little sugar with yours, don't you? We started marching, I think, in probably 2017-18. So, yeah, since, since then. Sandra follows the All Under One Banner movement on Facebook and reads about the march in Edinburgh. We follow them and look for notifications of where like, the next marches are going to be held. But first, it's time to look at the gas meter. Once a month, Sandra reads the meter and enters the result in an app. She hopes that economizing on heating will reduce her monthly bills. The people are having to make the choice whether they can eat or heat their homes, basically. They're having to make a choice. And in my case, obviously, I have growing children, so I have to make sure that they eat, so my priority is to make sure that they are fed and then for the heat we'll just um, just put on more layers to stay warm in the house. You want that they have to be aware but at the same time yeah you they're young they, they don't have you know they shouldn't have to be worrying about things like that bills and energy prices and things. And I'm pretty fine with it if it's causing less money. One day before the pro-independence march, Neil is packing the van in Glasgow with his fellow protesters. Bruno and Lynn are also members of All Under One Banner. That box we put in, so it's right beside the door. Right, I'll take another one. They need a PA system, sound equipment, and a mobile stage. All of it has to be set up in Edinburgh tomorrow morning. Before the pandemic, Neil managed to mobilize up to 200,000 people for one demonstration. But the COVID-19 restrictions on large events were a huge obstacle for his marches. It's difficult to get to estimate, but maybe five to 10,000 people. If we get that, if that happens tomorrow, it'll be, it'll be ideal. That'll be a really good turnout, because the weather's not going to be good. But it's Scotland, and the revolution isn't just going to be won in, in the sunshine. So, yeah. OK, let's open this one up. Neil and his team say Scotland has always been poorer than the south of the UK. They blame the government in Westminster for a lack of financial support. The Tory party are keeping the money for the rich people. The rich get rich and the poor get poorer. And that's what we're saying, make poverty history. We're sick of being skint. We're absolutely sick and tired of being skint up here. Scotland is rich in assets for fuel. We, ha we have... Uh, all the modern used uh, renewables, wind, uh, water. Uh, of course, we have the oil. <laughs> they tell us that the assets off the Scottish coast have been exploited by British companies for decades, with practically nothing left over for the Scots. So in the UK, uh, the myth is that Scotland is subsidised by England. But if you look at the, the statistics, it's, it's Scotland that subsidises England. It's the other way around. So it's a colonial situation, it's a parasitical situation. Um, so why, why should we be supporting uh, the people of England 
in, in a union which doesn't serve the people of Scotland. It makes no sense. After packing the van, Neil has a look online, as always. The debate is coming to a head there, too. Neil has his eye on one particular website, Scotland Matters, an influential body run by pro-unionists who oppose Scottish independence. It's a total contradiction, Scotland Matters, because for these people, Scotland doesn't matter. They like to make out, the, the ones that are against independence, that it's all about, it's all Nicola Sturgeon's plan, it's all her, it's her quest to get it done. But they forget that we've elected her and that we've elected the SNP numerous times and given democratic mandates. So, they try and, you know, circumvent uh, the, the drive for independence. It's the people that are driving it. But obviously not all people. The Scotland Matters website is Alan Sutherland's work. He's noticed how support for independence has been increasing in recent polls. It started Scotland Matters almost um, four years ago. The vote for the, the pro-UK parties has gone down, so our idea was to try and get beyond the bubble of people. There's a core of maybe three or 400,000 that really know what's going on and are in, in some way involved. So the whole other thing was to start informing people of the pro side, the, the arguments. Alan designs campaigns for social media, cartoons and memes to caricature the broken promises of First Minister Nicola Sturgeon, such as failing to deliver on climate targets. We've got a cartoonist to draw them. There's some social media sites like uh, UK Union Voice, uh, United Against Independence, No to Scottish Independence, a lot of good social media Facebook accounts. So we use, we send our images out to all these Facebook pages and uh, they, they share them. Before the last Scottish Parliament election, Alan launched a poster campaign showing the titanic failures of the First Minister. Slogans were plastered all over constituencies where the SNP's majority looked precarious. Education policy failures were also lampooned. After all, the condition of schools is also a matter for the regional government, not London. We had an impact on a few of the seats. There was a tactical voting campaign to vote against the SNP and because they're, they're gonna, they will come back and say, this is a mandate for another referendum, and which is what they did do. So what we did was put out uh, material saying they've screwed up Scottish education, the NHS, the, 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 all this devolved powers they have, they're not using them well. Don't vote for them. Vote for anybody. Indeed, the long-governing SNP was unable to regain its absolute majority and can now only govern in cooperation with the Green Party. Alan is thinking of new ways of keeping Scotland in the United Kingdom. The next day, Sandra sets off on a two-hour drive to the capital with Noah and Joseph. They want to join the pro-independence march. Trip to Edinburgh today, boys. Yeah. Are you excited? Sandra tells us that the bus connection is not very good, so they're driving. She's put around 50 euros worth of fuel in the tank, a small fortune for her. I budgeted money for petrol for today, because we've known about this march for quite a while. Um, and um, it's our first one since 2019. So we're, um, we're really looking forward to getting back at it. What will, you be, what will you be chanting? What do we want? Independence. When do we want it? No! Yay! Back in Stonehaven, Alan and Regina are also on their way, but to a different event. Regina Erich tells us that they no longer have contact with some of their friends and neighbors. 
Just like Brexit, the question of independence is incredibly divisive. In my opinion, it's become really important where you stand. There was a time in Germany when it was important to know whether people were Catholic or Protestant. Those times are over now, thank goodness. But in Scotland nowadays, when you meet a new person, or even if you know them well, people want to know, which side are you on? They're meeting fellow campaigners from Scotland Matters. All of them are against leaving the UK. On Johnston Terrace, Edinburgh, the march is about to start. Neil is handing out the banners for people to hold up during his all under one banner march. The weather's great. This isn't what was forecast. So, yeah, uh, the, fo the force is with us. <laughs> ah, I was looking about to see how many of us leave. We never wanted to leave. We voted yes to stay in, but we were taken out by England. <laughs> so we went back. You can stay. The procession starts at one o'clock and heads down the Royal Mile in central Edinburgh to the Scottish Parliament building at Holyrood. Neil documents it all for the social media account of his all under one banner movement. This is get reaches all across the globe and it shows that Scotland's awakening and we're going to win. Neil estimates that there are about 7,000 marchers. Undeterred by rail strikes and traffic jams, they've traveled from all parts of Scotland. These gentlemen are attending a family celebration at the classy hotel behind them. They won't be joining the march. I'm not a supporter of independence. I believe we're better as the United Kingdom. Why are you better in the United Kingdom? Because of the support we have as, the, as a greater. We've had a 300-year uh, merging of the parliaments, and it's been successful with a highly successful nation in the United Kingdom, in the Western world. Instead of talking to each other, people stick to their own camps. In Stonehaven, Alan Sutherland and Regina Erich meet their allies in the venerable Unionist Club. They join Barney Crockett, Labour politician and former mayor of Aberdeen, and Mark Openshaw, Alan's partner at Scotland Matters. They all know that support for independence has been growing over the years. Current polls indicate that a slim majority would now vote yes to Scottish independence. There's 30 percent of people in Scotland are unchangeable no, 30 percent un un immovably yes, and it's the people in the middle we need to be getting at. We need to be trying to convince you mean, these. By our side, you mean the people that are already yeah, the thoroughly opposed to right. separation. Yeah. yeah. The group need to find convincing arguments to disprove those of the pro-independence movement, such as the claim that only British firms and not the Scottish population profit from Scottish energy resources. It wasn't just Scotland's oil. Scotland was part of the UK. It's the entire UK's oil. If, if there was separation from the UK, in my view, 
uh, there would, and there was still a lot of revenue to be had from oil or wind, wind energy, there would have to be a huge negotiation. And if you think how much trouble it was to sort out Brexit, um, you know, that, that sort of uh, negotiation would be massive. They hope to convince undecided voters with their arguments in presentations, newsletters, and on social media. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think where I come in is to try and point that gap between the, the harsh realities of Mark speaking about. Our population is aging quicker than the rest of the UK, and this puts an enormous, again, additional strain on public funding. So it is almost inconceivable to come up with a, a feasible plan, or a feasible plan that doesn't entail enormous sacrifice in the early decades of independence. In Scotland, that's never the case. They know they can't sell it if they say it's going to be hard. So they have to say, well, no, it won't be hard. It'll be very easy. So it will have to just be based on emotion uh, and ignore the figures. It'll all be fine. <laughs> There are also questions regarding a hard border with England and the currency. Who has got it right? After getting stuck in traffic, Sandra and her children just make it as the march draws to a close. It's an expensive family outing, but she says it's all been worthwhile. Raises awareness uh, and hopefully other people um, take notice. Uh, and fingers crossed, October next year we get a referendum. While the tail end of the demo is still marching, musicians Neil and Henry set up in the tent next to the stage. They're glad of the chance to perform their songs, traditional pieces about Scottish freedom fighters, as relevant as ever for them. Finally, they're getting to play to a larger audience. Yeah, it's quite a big one. Yeah, quite a big one today. So a wee bit nervous, but not very much. It's fine. The United movement is prepared to take whatever it takes to win independence. That's what we're about. On the streets. The day is a success for nationalists. But shortly afterwards, the Supreme Court rules that the Scottish government cannot hold a referendum without the consent of the British Parliament. The SNP has declared that the next UK general election will be a de facto referendum for Scottish voters, but it will not be held until 2024. Now,